Welcome to Live from Plato's Cave. I am Mario Veen. This is episode 30, Henry Bergson's philosophy with Jean Proust. The French philosopher Henri Bergson seems to refer to Plato's cave when he writes, It is true that for the ancient philosophers the intelligible world was situated outside and above the one our senses and consciousness perceive. Our faculties of perception showed us only shadows projected in time and space by immutable and eternal ideas. And then he writes, But suppose that instead of trying to rise above our perceptional things, we were to plunge into it for the purpose of deepening and widening it. So it seems that Bergson contrasts his own vision of philosophy as deepening and widening our perception of the world we live in with that of Plato, of trying to rise above perception. But are Plato's allegory of the cave and Bergson's philosophy really in opposition? I found just the right guide for us to explore this, Jean Proust. We already spoke once in episode 19 about philosophy in general, and now we focus on our specialty, the philosophy of Henry Bergson. Jean has studied humanities, philosophy, and visual arts in Bordeaux, Berlin, and Paris. She has been teaching philosophy for the last 12 years in the United States. Jean is advocating for a widening of philosophical education beyond the academia frontiers by participating in different events open to the general public. You can find many of her public talks on her website. And Jean produced her own philosophy podcast, Can You Feel It? I highly recommend it. She's working on a book project about contrasting feminist views on female sexual desire. And Sean just moved to Santa Cruz, California, to teach as a lecturer for UCSC and to get involved with the Center for Public Philosophy. We talked last time, that was in the summer of 2022, I think. Yeah. I told you then, Bergson for me was like a good bottle of wine that you're waiting to open. <laughs> from the little things that I, I read from him, I just get so inspired by it that I think, well, if I get into this, I really have to take the time. Yeah. Um, to do that and um, and you did and it did not disappoint <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being willing to discuss this with me it's really a privilege it's like a private philosophy uh, lesson <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure I'm always glad to speak about this philosopher specifically and I'm glad that we share the same enthusiasm in regards to his writing that's great so can you tell me why? Is uh, I think you mentioned somewhere else that he's he's your favorite philosopher. Yeah. Why Bergson? What is it about him that, yeah, why Bergson? Right. So um, it's so first of all, I would say that Bergson's philosophy sounded to me from the first time when I first encountered it as a form of poetry. And that actually was very appealing to me, uh, specifically at the, at the time, because I was in the context of learning a lot about Hegel and Heidegger. And it was extremely, I would say, a bit cold for me, a bit, a bit hard. And all of a sudden, I find this writer that has a way of writing that's very aesthetic. And that aesthetic aspect really drew me to Bergson immediately. There is this artistic, poetic philosophy here with this metaphorical style that is very, very appealing to me. And uh, so that's not only about the style, though, though I have to say the clarity and the elegance with which his writing definitely contributed to my being finally reconciled almost with philosophy. Because I have to say at that time I was doing my bachelor in philosophy in Berlin and I was not about to give up, but I was like, okay, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is not the, the actual path that I want to take. Maybe I should go in literature and study, you know, something else than philosophy. But, uh, but Bergson brought me back on track and uh, not only because of his style, but also because of his main concern in regards to time and the way he looks at it, namely duration and how he looks at duration as this intrinsically creative force, this impredictability, this novelty. And so that emphasis on change, on evolution, on the perpetual reshaping of us always becoming is something that was also extremely seductive to me. 
I have also to say perhaps that uh, one other aspect that really drew me to him was the attention he has towards psychology as a way that is not, uh, you know, in a way that's not static, it's not mechanistic, it's not looking at our psychology with, you know, say, categories of thoughts, etc. Um, in fact, is looking way more at, 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 this, at this flow of consciousness, right? We can think of Whitehead, for instance, or Deleuze as well, right? Or originally, we can think of Heraclitus, but really within his own conception of psychology, there is also this concern for time, for process that I found very, very interesting. So, yeah, it's, it, it actually shaped my, the way of, of in a way, it, it, not only was it interesting for me philosophically, but it did shape my life in a way. It, it really, you know, it, I, I do look at the world differently from the perspective of Bergson. So you just had a really big storm in California, right? Yeah. Um, so is there anything that you notice that, that you think about Bergson or that, that this influences you while you, I, I imagine you have to deal with a lot of stuff, a lot of in uncertainty with this storm or is that yeah. too far fetched? No, it is not. I mean, I would say the storm, like this kind of, you know, uh, random circumstance that I found myself in, you can also, you know, think of any kind of moment in time in your life where it becomes a bit of a struggle, where you have no control over what's happening and it's hard. I have to say that that thinking through uh, the Bergsonian lens sometimes helped me uh, to uh, to look at my mood differently. So for instance, instead of looking at my mood as a, a static state that I have to analyze, I am actually reminded by Bergson to look at it as a flow. And I, I look at the changes uh, that I cannot foresee indeed. And so this brings me hope that, you know, the moods I might have on the moment be a bit of, like say, anxiety or, or fear, you know, during the, during the storm, for instance, will change also. And not only the future of the storm within itself is unpredictable, but my reacting to it is also unpredictable. And so I apply what Bergson says about consciousness to mood and temper in what you know what what uh, in, in in that regard i would say so it's it's that actually echoes a, a very famous quote from him where he says to exist is to change to change is to mature to mature is to go on creating oneself endlessly and we cannot know what this creation what forms this creation will take right and that is that has to do also with with mood i think is is an interesting way of looking at it the little I've read now, I mean, we're, we're discussing the creative mind, which is a collection of uh, lectures. The, the thing that comes back ag again and again is that reality is change and that we tend to think of the world as fixed and stable. Um, but this is actually an abstraction. This is something that I, I, I'm just trying to summarize and then I would love mm -hmm. for you to correct me. Okay. <laughs> sure. Go ahead. We're thinking in abstractions and concepts most of the time as we go about our daily lives because mm -hmm. this is what works practically because we're mm -hmm. busy with, with something. We have a goal. So we look towards this goal. We don't look... I mean, if I'm, if I'm driving my car to a destination, I'm not so much looking around me at the, at the color of the tree or something because that would be distracting from the action that I'm doing. Yep. But he's saying that, so you, there are different ways of thinking about uh, stability and change. Mm -hmm. And you can say, well, um, fundamentally, the world is fixed and eternal. And the changes that we are see, we see they, they are kind of an illusion. They're not, or they're not as real as the eternal ideas. But I think that he is saying that no change, that's the constant. Or constant is maybe not a good word, but that's right. the most fundamental, right? Yeah, absolutely. Change is what comes first, so to say. We tend to, and that's a, a natural feature of our thinking. That's what Bergson says, is that we, we tend to, to fixate things because it's easier to think on something that is stable. So we have this tendency of making what is supposed to be temporal 
actually specialized. So we make it as if it was space, something we can just, you know, step on, some, something we can rely on as stable, as static, right? And that is just not what reality is made of. Reality is time in essence, so to say. And so that, that's also a beautiful, I mean, it, it seems simple when, when, when we say it like this, but we are so used to not think that way of, you know, about reality. It, it is actually very hard to really yeah. dive into the durational or the temporal nature of reality in that regard, because our mind, our, our thinking processes are so used to precisely just lay out the different, when we think of choice, for instance, when we think of like so many different things, we need to lay that in front of us as if they were just static elements that then we could, so, so we could analyze and then recombine, etc. But we don't think at, at the very fact that, we don't think about the very fact that this is a processual, this is a process, this is something that takes time and not only takes time, but is time in a way. And so that that is that is something we can speak about a bit a bit later. I loved when you spoke about um, about the fact that we also perceive in a different uh, in a different way. Like when we do uh, use perception, we actually cut through uh, what what we look at. And uh, and indeed, when you look at, I would say you have really three big. Uh, um, uh, three big functions that uh, that Bergson criticizes. So perception, language, and intelligence. Perception, language, and intelligence function the same way as practical means for us to navigate the world in a useful way, in a, in a, in a way where that allows us to, to basically act in it, okay? So perception, language, and intelligence serve action, okay? So, and, and Bergson says that before philosophizing, one must leave. He says, and life demands that we put on blinders, right? So our mind, when we perceive and when we talk and when we think, usually, needs to select what is useful to identify what interests us, to analyze, to cut. So it needs, the, and it has, I would say, inherently, this ability and this tendency to, to use distinction, differentiation, division. And, and I, I, I'm just thinking here, for instance, at uh, uh, the movie The Born Identity, where, uh, where, for instance, I, I, I do remember in that movie that at some point there is this cinematographic effects where you can see how Bourne is perceiving the environment he is within to look at exits. And so you can precisely see that he's not looking at, you know, the people around the tables in that bar he is. He's looking at, okay, that is a door right there. That is a window right there. And so you can precisely see, and you see that in, in a lot of action movies, actually, but also in real life, we do that all the time. We, are, we, we wear the glasses of the use we can make or the action we desire to actually do in our environment. And so that shapes the way we perceive the world we are in. So perceiving for the sake of perceiving, for mere pleasure, really, as, as, as Bergson encourages us to do, without any gain or use or practical purposes, is not something that we naturally do. It's something that artists do. It's something that philosophers probably should do. But it is very hard to precisely be detached like that. We are not naturally able to displace our attention like this, but artists are actually able to do that, and philosophers should do the same. <laughs> yeah, th these are two of my favorite quotes from... So the first step is that, I'll just read the quote, mm -hmm. a distinct perception is merely cut for the purposes of practical existence out of a wider canvas. Mm -hmm. So my idea is that everything is available to us, but for practical purposes we always make a selection like uh, Jason Bourne looking for the exits mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. if I visit the house from somebody I look do, are there any signs of cats and I look right. at their bookcases <laughs> for instance or if I'm thirsty I'm going to be looking at potential source of water yeah exactly mm -hmm. yeah yeah then the next step is to connect this to artists so mm -hmm. I, I read a qu another quote there for hundreds of years in fact there have been Man whose function has been precisely to see and to make us see what we do not naturally perceive. They are the artists. Mm -hmm. What is the aim of art if not to show in nature and in the mind outside of us and within us 
things which did not explicitly strike our senses and our consciousness. And then a little bit later he says, if we accept uh, painters and admire them, it's because we had already perceived something of what they showed to us. But we had perceived without seeing. It was for us a brilliant and vanishing vision, lost in the crowd of those visions, equally brilliant and equally vanishing, which become overcast in our ordinary experience. Mm -hmm. So this is the part I love that it's not, well, we can get to play to scave later, but it's not going outside of, of the ordinary world of perception, but rather the artist sees something Mm -hmm. uh, they see something new in what everybody sees, but they don't really actively see it. Mm -hmm. But they're able to show it to us because uh, they're not showing something outside of our world. They're sh showing something that's inside of our world mm -hmm. that we see all the time, but they are able to focus on it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's a question of attention. Yes, I, I really like the last quote you actually brought in. What we, you know, but what we perceive, what, uh, um, sorry, it says, you said, if we accept painters and admire them, it is because we had already perceived something of what they show us. So it's not that we're entirely removed from the way artists see the world. In fact, we perceived without seeing, right? That's what, that's what, so. The artist sees and not only so here it, it actually reminds me of Leibniz and what Leibniz calls the little perception. So the little perception is actually something that I don't see. For instance, yeah. uh, let's say there is some white noise that is in the background. I'm not paying attention to it. Nonetheless, it is something I perceive without seeing or in this case without hearing, you know. So it is it is a little bit how we go usually in our lives because we need to act because we need to live. So we don't have that time for contemplation that I was talking about earlier. It's, it's, uh, and I, I would say that, you know, this real contemplation and also real speculation philosophically can only be done when we are removed from the urgent pressure of action. So it is very rare. It is a privileged position when one can find oneself in, you know, to just be able to find that time precisely to just dive into that contemplative mode. Right. And so and so here, the, the role of the artist, I think it's, it's really beautiful what Bergson says about the artist. It's it's a person that is able to see better than normal people. Right. Because for normal people, and here I quote Bergson again, the eye sees only what the mind is prepared to comprehend and is prepared to comprehend with a practical use in mind, precisely, right? So the artist has that kind of like superpower in a way, which is interesting to see reality naked without those veils or those this crust of useful habits and conventions that covers reality, that veils reality, right? Yeah, at, le at least a part of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's interesting because that also echoes uh, Proust. I mean, Proust was, after all, a, a contemporary, uh, you know, a very famous writer uh, of Bergson uh, at the same time. And it was, it was, uh, he also described the artist as the type of person that will help the uh, the audience remove the cataract that they have on their eyes. So whenever you go see, let's say. Uh, you know, a Monet or a Renoir uh, exhibition, you actually get uh, an operation of your eye that removes that precise, that crust, right? Oh, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's a, I mean, Bergson, in a way, says something uh, very similar. Because yeah. when we look at an object, says Bergson, we usually see the use we can make of it. And we need to go fast and we need to be efficient. We need to be productive. We have things to do, etc. The artist doesn't. The artist has a useless look onto life. <laughs> they are able to go beyond that automatic kind of like pilot, automatic pilot perception, right? To access reality itself without those hiding layers of commodity that we superimpose on it. He's saying, well, two things. So that it's seeing for the sake of seeing mm -hmm. rather than for the sake of acting. So just look, just looking, which is maybe the hardest thing to do. It's just look at something and just look rather than, yeah, have all these acting associations in your mind. Mm -hmm. And the other part which interests me is that he said, well, only some of us can be artists, but fortunately there's philosophy because everyone can be a philosopher. So <laughs> I like this idea that the artists have this 
kind of special power in them, which right. I... Yeah, I've been I've been uh, going to the Van Gogh Museum. How do you say his name in in French? Van Gogh. Or Van Gogh. Van Gogh or... Yeah, I, I guess you pronounce it better. Van than Gogh. We do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that. Uh, no, I mean he's. I mean that that's nice because you're French. I'm Dutch, and he was living in Holland in Den right. Haag, where where I'm right now actually, but also in in France, of course. Yes. So uh, I guess he pronounced his name two ways as well. Mm -hmm. But he's been writing these letters and it's really almost literally what Bergson says is that he says, well, I, he's, he's in nature and he's, he's seeing this something about, so he's seeing a tree, but he's seeing something about a tree. And then he's mm. struggling with yeah, running home and, and taking his canvas and trying to, I mean, the hard work for him because in the beginning he was not, not a very good painter technically, was how to get this intuition onto the um, canvas, mm -mm -mm. Uh, which just, if you read his letters, it's just like practice, 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 practice without any right. recognition. And just kind of this fire keeps him going and not giving up and trying, even though people ridicule him and he mm -hmm. doesn't sell anything. But mm. the for I think the connection I made with Bergson is that he has this, intuition or this perception mm -hmm. that he finds well i must communicate this in some way i must show this to other people mm -hmm. and and the way i see that tree is precisely kind of cleaned from all the symbols that help us act all these conventional and practical generalities that we usually use in order to navigate reality right so it's really brushed aside now it's it's actually easier i feel like when we when we read bergson perhaps also when we read van gogh um to to define the artist purpose negatively namely like what an artist is able to do or needs to do is to brush aside those symbols to to push push away all these practical generalities etc but then what exactly does the artist uh, see is not uh, necessarily easy to you know necessarily easy to, to to describe and so it's it's interesting for me to give a bit of space to that and to to say well maybe this contemplative or intuitive mode of looking at the world can take many forms you know it's i, I don't know what for instance what 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 uh, van gogh sees in that tree might differ greatly from you know what i don't know cezanne would have seen in that tree etc so it's 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 always all the, that that perception also is going to have a personal touch, right? So it's not going to yeah. touch the universal necessarily, but it's going to be still way closer to reality itself. That's interesting to me because usually we think of reality or authentic reality, that immediacy with reality as something that is objective and therefore universal. Whereas if we think of, of art, it's more about a personal uh, perception, a personal take on this, you know, this specific tree, this specific, you know, uh, object I'm looking at, but this is going to be actually different from one artist to the other, right? But doesn't, so, doesn't this have to do also with, um, uh, it, this is almost Heidegger, but because when you're, when Van Gogh uh, is seeing a tree, he's always in a certain kind of mood. So mm -hmm. in order to paint this perception, he also has to paint this mood. So he's right. not just painting the tree but in order to be able to paint the tree he also has to paint the way he sees the tree rather right. than as something outside of him or something that has nothing to do with him right and that could lead us to say well the reality this authentic reality that bergson is mentioning has more to do with our relationship with reality than than about that objective reality that we're so, you know, so attached to describe as philosophers, as scientists as well. Precisely this, this inner reality that you describe, the, the feelings in front of that tree, for instance, might be what, is, what, what gets us closer to, uh, to perhaps duration or, or whatever Bergson values as this true reality, right? So, but it's, it's to, to me, looking at, 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 at Bergson's way of philosophizing, but also as, you know, the way he describes artists, really uh, um, awakens a form of renewed curiosity, of marvel, really, at this incredible richness of what we can apprehend in reality. Visually, that's for sure, and that's why the, the image of the painter comes back all the time. Auditorially as well, by hearing, but also by smelling, by tasting. Mm -hmm 
by touching. Yep. And I think even if I don't, I don't think I, I don't have the memory of a passage in Bergson that insists on what we call the poor senses, right? So you know, uh, smell, uh, touch, and, and taste. But but it is also very interesting for me to kind of uh, take that uh, as 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 Bergsonian also, because it it is it is very interesting to just take the time to be like let me think of smells that are absolutely useless to me right now and try to appreciate them for the way they are in their temporality as well huh? so let me look at this tree not only for what it is now snapshot but you know photograph of that of that tree now but how i see the wind evolve through its you know its its uh through its leaves etc or or again you know tasting something, touching something, touch needs time in order to be even appreciated, right? And of course, hearing needs time. And here you think about the famous metaphor of the melody that actually Bergson is not the only one to mention, to speak about how we need that duration, that time in order to even appreciate a melody, right? And without that, that temporal aspect, there is no melody, right? But so it's, it's uh, this vision of the artist that Bergson promotes really makes us not only reflect of what we experience through our five senses, but also on what I feel inside as being essentially temporal, changing, remorphing itself perpetually. And so marveling at that too is something that I think Bergson encourages us to do. Yeah, so he doesn't disconnect uh, the outside from the inside. Right. Yeah. Reading Bergson is also... You just mentioned uh, his poetic language, but it's not, it's not, I mean, he's a good writer, but it's not just an extra for his philosophy. I think it's integral to his philosophy, right? These images that he paints, as, a, as it were, with words. And he, he's also saying somewhere, we have just two means of expression, concept and image. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah, these... Um, so I'm struggling to find words, but maybe I should get to that part because that is the part I, I, I wrote you already about um, what he says about philosophers. So mm -hmm. really connects to how I've been reading philosophers. I'll just read the quote, okay? Mm -hmm. A philosopher worthy of the name has never said more than a single thing. And even then, it is something he has tried to say rather than actually said. I mean, that's already very beautiful. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, and he has said only one thing because he has seen only one point. And at that, it was not so much a vision as a contact. This contact has furnished an impulse. This impulse, a movement. And this movement, which is, as it were, a kind of swirling of dust taking a particular form, becomes visible to our eyes only through what it has collected along its way. It is no less true that other bits of dust might as well have been raised and that it would still have been the same whirlwind. Um, again, connecting to the storm mm. <laughs> that you've just gone yeah. through. <laughs> right on point. I've been reading philosophy for, for a long time and sometimes you're reading something and you feel, well, I feel there's something else there that this philosopher doesn't quite say or it doesn't get quite expressed. Mm -hmm. um, so I have maybe like this, this idea, but it comes back once in a while, maybe once in a year or something. I think about this and then I read this quote. I think, well, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. this image of the whirlwind that is, I mean, the whirlwind is invisible to us because how do, how do we see it? Because how do we see a tornado or a storm mm. because of everything that it um it takes yeah. within yeah or it, yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's an interesting quote i was i was uh, i was excited that you that you chose it it's not it's not exactly one of the clearest passages that you would have in uh, in bergson for sure but it insists really on the fact that um to perceive what a philosopher's intuition is we cannot just gather fragments and, and reconstruct, you know, those fragments as some sort of like mosaic or assemblage, where in fact, each philosophy functions like an organism. I think Bergson insists a lot on that. It's, a, it's something that is alive. It is not something that is static and dead, right? Yeah. So a philosopher doesn't merely really recompose with, uh, with originality, says ideas from the past, but, but the philosopher conveys 
a certain personal tone, maybe, or, or voice, or breath, perhaps. We could, we could use the metaphor of the breath. Uh, this way we have the, whirl, the whirlwind as well uh, in, in it. Unifying this, th these various parts, but in a way that is making this whole organism alive, right? So that, 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 that soul or that intuition of every philosophical system is really a movement of thought, right? So it, again, he insists here on the movement and Bergson wants to make us all able to see everything under that very concern for movement. As, as we say in, in Latin, yeah. and, he, and he speaks about that, he says, subspecie durationis, so under the angle of duration, right? We have to detach ourselves from this mechanistic, immobile collections of parts in order precisely to see the movement, to see that contact that we can have with something that's not a mere assemblage, but with something that's really a voice, a breath, right? Yeah, and this is, I mean, it's a huge, um, how do you say that, not accusation, against, something like that against analytic philosophy, right? Uh, do you oh, know yes. this, uh, this, this, this famous quote from Whitehead about Western philosophy are footnotes to Plato? Haha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I, I mean, this is often misquoted, but the, what he actually says is, I think, very close to this as well. I don't know if he was influenced by Bergson, but he was, he's also saying that Plato was saying something, maybe not even saying something, because this is the, the first part of the quote I read. What I love is that a philosopher is not someone who is saying something. Mm -hmm. but someone who is trying to say something, but never really right. succeeds. But you keep on trying, you keep on trying. And you keep on trying from this, like uh, Van Gogh, uh, this kind of initial intuition or this contact or this original perception that you will never be able to really put into words. So Whitehead is saying something about Plato, I think along those lines that he was doing that with, well, a lot of, the, the basis of Western philosophy, but he's also then implicitly criticizing people who make a system out of it. So the, I would mm. say the Platonists that make mm. kind of a model of what did he say and what are the exact stages of the cave and what is the, um, and the analytic philosophy part is, is I think focusing on how can we devise a system of concepts? Mm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm simplifying too much, but. Mm. Well, I definitely want to go back on, on, and I think you mentioned that earlier as well, uh, this idea that, well, philosophers struggle with language, <laughs> precisely, yeah. right? And uh, at least Bergson himself, as I said, perception, intelligence and language are, you know, all at the service of, 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 of practical life, right? And so language also is very impoverished in a way. It doesn't allow us usually to grasp precisely the duration. That's why Bergson tries so hard to come up with all these metaphors, but no metaphor is actually adequate enough because language itself is problematic, right? And so and so I, I see, I, I mean, I don't know if all philosophers will say that. Some philosophers, you know, give a, I, I think of Hegel who says, well, you know, it's only when you actually can verbalize something, can, can put something into words that the thought becomes clear. Bergson says the opposite. Like there is actually yeah. way, way more, <laughs> way more wealth into, into the, this blurry kind of thought before it is being impoverished into words, right? That are way too abstract and generalizing and make a lose really the singularity of the real experience. Um, but yeah, so I, I just wanted to, to go back to, to go back on that and uh, and and language by nature is analytical right so it does does the same thing than perception as we described earlier namely this idea of cutting through of distinguishing of separating in order to see clearer right but by seeing clearer in that analytical way we actually get blinded <laughs> in regards to reality itself and namely this duration that Bergson puts as a very core of it, yeah. Yeah, I think just just one example that I think of is um, because he's saying it's, he's using another metaphor, like it's like bottling water from the spring. Uh, the moment comes from the spring, so water from the sp spring is very fresh, and then you bottle it, and it becomes kind of uh, insipid. I think it's the word. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I'm thinking about, uh, and he's all, this is also something that he's repeating a lot, that we use words and concepts. I mean, they, they, have, they come from maybe in, in the first instance from this intuition, but then we use them in, in instances uh, beyond that, that are not. Um, and I think one of the um, central metaphors of our society is that of the machine and not that of the computer. And our brain is like a computer. And... Uh, mm -hmm. Our body is like a machine and we have to fix it and, and all that stuff. So I think that's one of the, because when we look at technology, we try to figure out how a machine works because that's very useful because we have a lot of benefits from technology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But a side effect of that is that we start to use the language of control and prediction and yeah, all that Dexon stuff. is very is actually way more. I, 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 yeah, I hear what you say. He's very relevant to read today, also mm. with precisely that concern for technology and and the way we become these very highly productive machines ourselves, depending highly on other productive machines such as computers, right? But it is very interesting to look at uh, to look at this intuitive philosophy, precisely in in such a time as a, as a time we are we're going through right now. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, it, it, it takes me back to um, here, perhaps to, you know, in what way I would say Bergson is, is very important to me is that because he really allows us precisely to be less analytical when everything in the world today, as you say yourself, makes us being willing to be more analytical, right? Or more, you know, more focused on this like mechanistic way of looking at the world. And so reading Bergson to me, I think is helpful to be less analytical, to be more sensitive to the way things just naturally unfold and to be detached from the use we can make of our thinking. So to, to look at how language, our intelligence, our perception again, affect the way we perceive things in a way that renders them static, right? Dead or, or, or really, you know, the idea here to, is to, to stop being willing to better master things analytically. And, and it doesn't mean that the intuition lacks rigor. You know, that's another thing that was reproached to, uh, to Bergson, who had a lot of female fans also. And so that's an interesting aspect <laughs> of his reception. And a lot of people against Bergson say, well, that's, that's, not, that's no philosophy because it's precisely, you know, Just like very, the mystery, very... feely stuff about right, intuition. Right, exactly. It's not, not rigorous yeah. enough. Proof is a woman are interested in opposite. his philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's right. saying the opposite, right? He's saying, well, actually, the most important thing about uh, philosophers is this intuition and that they are able to, I mean, all the stuff around it and the language and the images, okay, that's very important, but those are all changing all the time. And the way they can convince you is if they are able to convince you of the certainty of their original intuition. Yeah, yeah. And I think there is actually a humility in Bergson that's very valuable in that regard to, to realize yeah. precisely this the, the undue pretensions of our intelligence, the poverty of our language and of our perception. And I think there is a huge humility lesson to be taken from this like effort or called for effort to reverse our habitual mode of intelligence and to let go of the analytic way of building knowledge and adopt what he calls this truly sympathetic attitude, right? He speaks about being sympathetic to ourselves in order to find duration and to help us align with our intuition. That's always, you know, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty funny because it's something that I otherwise would probably have been a bit allergic about, <laughs> aller allergic to, because I, it, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I'm someone who would rarely advise, you know, people to trust their gut or to go for their intuitive approach over their rational approach, for instance. Yeah. And, and more than that, I would say that I struggle today with the word spirituality. So when he speaks about, you know, the spiritual inner self, etc., to me, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it's uh, we really need to take it in the context of Bergson and it's not the, you know, the twisted or hijacked new form of religious or positive psychology type of spirituality, right? So it's, it's, uh, it, it's interesting for me to have to, okay, re retake that idea of intuition, that idea of spiritual in another context than the one that, that we are actually being sold today, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I know what you mean. I have this, maybe uh, I can look it up quickly. I think I said in our last conversation, like I'm, I'm a very spiritual person. 
but mm -hmm. I'm not a religious person. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that cleared this up is a quote. Uh, maybe, I, yeah, mm -hmm. I find it here. It's by Laszlo Groff and Russell. Mm -hmm. What's the book called again? I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll send it later, but mm -hmm. this is the quote. Spirituality is a private matter reflecting the relationship between the individual and the cosmos. By comparison, religion is an organized activity that requires a particular place and a system of appointed mediators arranged in a hierarchy. Mm. So um, when, when they say sp uh, spirituality is a private matter reflecting the relationship between the individual and the cosmos, would that connect to Bergson's use of the word? The cosmos in this sense is, is the whole. Right, right. It it could be absolutely. I would the way I look at at spiritual here is just as a, a kind of a counter concept uh, to intellect, uh, mostly. So it's it's almost like a to me it's almost like a negative concept. It is not intellect. It is not this practically oriented intelligence that I was describing earlier. So the spiritual approach would be an approach that way more again intuitive. It's almost a synonym of intuitive to me in that regard. So now yeah. you could very well say that okay. intuition has to do precisely with how we feel that connection between the self and the cosmos. Why not? It's, it's one way of, of seeing it. But I don't think you need to even 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 go there. It's um, I, I would I would remain relatively, I would say, cautious at, at, at providing a positive definition of what spiritual means for Bergson. But I can at least give a negative definition of what spiritual means by opposing it to intelligence. That's how I would proceed. <laughs> so in, in kind of a similar way as we talked about the artist before, that you're not. Yeah. There for, for busy with a certain action, but you're maybe taking off the blinders, trying to take off the blinders, trying to be open to the wider uh, canvas that you that you don't see. So maybe also the recognition exactly. that there will always be something that is there. It is um, real, but you won't be able to grasp it. But it is there. Right. Rather again, than saying it's... only what we can grasp is real. Right, and it's, it's again a negative definition. As I said earlier, we don't know what the artist will see. We don't know what a person who's trying to gain that intuitive approach will apprehend and, and appreciate about their environment. Nonetheless, we can say that it comes only when we let go of this kind of, you know, uh, practically oriented way of looking at the world, basically. So that's mm. what I mean when I said negative definition, for sure. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's just uh, interesting for me to look at the way, and you really helped me think about that. Like in what way Bergson, you know, plays a, a big role in my in my thinking. So not only personally, but also just you know this idea of enlarging one's approaches to thinking by incorporating this intuitive embrace, right? And and an embrace that's committed to observe how time creates continually and leaves us totally unable to predict. I think there is a, there is a, a beauty, something a, a bit scary as well, but a, a beauty in that. And, and also, of course, because I worked a lot on the will and the definitions of willpower, its weaknesses and its diseases, I think it's, it's very interesting to look at Bergson when we get paralyzed and scared by indecision, for instance. And in that regard, Bergson helped me grasp another way of looking at freedom or free will that helped me look at indecision as a false problem, <laughs> relying on false assumptions about the very nature of, of our freedom. Why, why is the false problem? Because it's, a, it's not a bad thing to be undecisive or... Well, it has to do with uh, the, very, uh, the very misconception we have of the word possible. Uh, yeah. And here I, uh, I I go back to to one thing you you wanted to discuss uh, with, uh, which is when when um, when Bergson is arguing against an ideal pre-existence of the possible to the real. Yeah, that's that precisely doing that helps us not being scared of the 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 the, the, the smashing responsibility of our free will because we don't look at it in the same way. Free will uh, advocates speak of uh, of freedom and indeterminacy uh, as I would say uh, a competition 
and I think that's Bergson saying that also as a competition between possibilities. Um, they look at freedom as a choice between these possibilities and they're wrong doing that because yeah, freedom... So, so you, right. the, the idea, the rational idea is that, for instance, in, in you have to vote and then uh, you consider all the possible options mm -hmm. and then you vote or you buy a product but you consider all the possible options and you do that or you wake up in the morning and you think a list of yeah what is possible for me today to do that and then out of these options you select something exactly exactly usually the way we understand freedom uh, it's it involves always this plurality of equally possible alternatives yeah that are presented to us and the free person has to choose among them that's basically and they, how they we exist think of it. first because you first have all these possibilities right and then out of all these possibilities that first exist you choose one because it has to be like that because you can only choose something you can only do something which is possible something can only happen when it's possible Right. And those future possibles, in a way, are then presented to pre-exist somehow. They already exist in a way, right? And that's precisely what Bergson says is problematic. Because, again, for most yeah, defenders that's of, so of free will... so fascinating. Yeah, it is, it is, I think, one of the most fascinating ideas in, in Bergson. And not only fascinating on a philosophical perspective, but also... And Bergson says that it helps us live better. And I do believe that tremendously. I think it, I, I was speaking about my mood, etc. And how Bergson has, has a power of affecting the way I look at moods, for instance. But he also has a, I think, can be a huge relief when we think of precisely this anxiety we have over the future. What we look at when we speak about the future is just a projection of what we can imagine that future to be, but it is, of course, a mere, a mere illusion. And so, and so that's, focusing on that, it's actually very hard to do, to be convinced of that. It's easy yeah. to say, oh yeah, I get the idea, I, you know, I, I, I get it, I can, I can conceive it, of it, but I'm not necessarily, oh, okay, I now, I embody it, you know, and so, and I think there is really a huge relief that can come from that, indeed. Like, for instance, you know, usually say, you know, I am free to choose between these future possibles, one being scenario X, one being scenario Y. After this interview, for instance, uh, I can go out for a stroll despite the rain, uh, and that presents the same level of possibility for me as not going and staying in. Okay, so scenario X, I go for a stroll after this interview. Scenario Y, I, I, I stay in. And I think that the future will be this or that. And my free will has to consist into selecting between X or Y, right? For Bergson, this way of looking at the future is highly misleading and it results from a specialization of time again. We specialize, we see X on the left and we see Y on the, on the right, right? And we're going to have to, we're going to be able to choose between the two as if we stopped time for a second and we were able to look at them specially. But that's not how it works. While we are thinking of X or Y, time is passing and time grows and time makes us grow. And even in the time of hesitation, of deliberation, we are still being built or being, being uh, shaped. Our will is being shaped. So in fact, there is no temporal anteriority of the possible before its realization. It is only when something actually happens, when it becomes real, that it can be said to have been possible, right? Or to be possible. So we have to wait for something to be real to be able to call it possible. And so that, I think that's, uh, that's at first, you're like, well, what do you mean? Because we're so used of this idea of possibility being, again, kind of on a, on a, on a bookshelf or on a cupboard where we could just, you know, open the door and be like, okay, possible A, possibility A, possibility B, possibility C. Let's see which one will I choose. <laughs> you know? And it just, it just doesn't work this way at all. In fact, we ought to be always surprised at, at how, at, 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 at the way things turn out. For because instance, they're never, you know, yeah, they're yeah. never like you expect them. Even if, I mean, yes, they're because you, like you say, you've, you've maybe, um, you, you have okay, negative example, but you choose uh, after this interview to go to this concert of your favorite band, but mm -hmm. then you're there and then you have a headache, which affects 
you know exactly. <laughs> the way uh, you, so you, and you cannot predict those things yeah something unpredictable can happen but also the way i'm envisioning for instance my going for a stroll after this interview it's not going to look at all like i what what i what i thought it would be or perhaps i will be retrospectively thinking oh yeah it was exactly as i envisioned it but i'm always going to say that after the fact <laughs> you know and and actually i will filter yeah. down and I my guess experience that's, that's also right go ahead sorry I, i get very excited about this because i get <laughs> excited because it's such a simple idea but it's and it's also an idea that we have to i mean we have to uh, remember that these are like he's just instructing us as well that these are the concepts But we mm -hmm. have to try to get from the concepts and the images to the intuition that he's speaking about. And we can actually recognize this intuition in our mm -hmm. everyday life, no matter how small. And, yeah. and the part I get excited about is because it has so many implications. Because one implication is also about regret. Because Absolutely. if you see the world as, yeah, I mean, we all have situations where you're thinking between two it could be a big decision am i going to marry this person or not am i going to take this job or not and then you might not take the job but then you might always wonder what if i would have chosen this other possibility how would my life have gone but absolutely then we we speak about this possibility as if it actually existed but yeah i think what bergson is saying no you are projecting it Yeah, it, I mean, regret is definitely one aspect that that is being put into question by Bergson. FOMO, fear of missing out, is also definitely something that that can be questioned by the Bergsonian way of looking at freedom, which is something I discussed in an article that was published uh, last April in uh, in um, in the magazine Noema. And it's uh, to to me, Bergson is a huge help to FOMO, but also. Look at look at the way, and here I'm going to speak about the his, history as well. How how this conception of the possible can also make us think differently at the work of historians, right? And uh, when we try to explain something happening at a point in time by looking for its past causes, right? It is actually the perspective of that point in time that will make us see certain past events as the causes of the present. But at that past moment. When these causes occurred, we didn't see them as causes. It's only afterwards, right? So, for instance, it is only after, uh, after the fact, after uh, World War I was started, that it seemed obvious that its main cause was the assassination of, you know, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, for instance. It, it, it took for the World War, uh, for the for the first Great War to begin, for us to then retrospectively say, oh yeah. The cause was actually the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. So it's uh, it's uh, it's it's also interesting not only I would say psychologically to deal with regret and FOMO and things like that, but also in the way we look at uh, at history. Yeah, history in in that way is then a projection, and in, in a sense, it could also change, right? Right, and I think you you actually uh, send my way some interesting quote about that, where you said, and it Bergson says, I quote. It is only by a lucky accident or exceptional good fortune that we can accurately note in the present reality what will be of most interest for the future historian. When that historian's studies are present, he will be seeking in particular the explanation of his present and more especially of what is new in his present. Yeah. So he's going to come with that perspective already, right? So therefore bringing you know, this idea of precisely the possible being a mirage right a mirage of the present in the past last time i almost forgot to discuss plato's cave with you so uh, oh. we can do that but first in connection with what you just said so i did some past episodes about climate change and mm -hmm. this clarified something for me as well because bruno latour the uh, philosopher who yeah. recently i think last year he died um, he wrote this book about climate change called facing Gaia mm -hmm. and there he says we have become the generation that could have prevented this could we have, if we had acted 30 or 40 years ago mm -hmm. and I've been speaking with activists as well and young activists and I understand really I understand the anger of young people who are so yeah. angry that first of all what this older generation has done that they didn't stop it and now it's like I mean, there are things we cannot reverse anymore. And mm -hmm. 
number two, that they're still not seeing a change. Mm -hmm. I think it has a lot to do with this. I think it's easy to, from our perspective, to say, well, but you know, you knew about the IPCC reports. Right. You knew about climate change and everything. But the way I grew up in, I was actually concerned with it as uh, my, for my family and everything in growing up mm. in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So this awareness was there, but it was not there in the way that it is here. It was there as, you know, sustainability. It was not there as an urgent matter. It was as someone has to do something about this. Right. I, I think, though, I, I see totally what you mean, though I have to say that's where I think perhaps there is a political uh, limit or, or say the, the political interpretation of that notion of possible by Bergson can be a bit problematic because there might be occurrences, though I totally get what you mean about the, the zeitgeist of a moment that it's easier, it, it's, of course, it's easy after the fact to say, well, guys, you could have figured that out. You know, you had all the data in hand. Like, why didn't you do something? I, I see yeah. what you mean. It, it doesn't take into consideration what, what did this re present really looked like without, you know, foreseeing what precisely they couldn't foresee, what, where we are now, for instance. But, but I think nonetheless, there might be a probability aspect to take into consideration here in regards to, okay, there is, let's say, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I don't know, I, uh, I'm going to build some kind of, uh, uh, I'm going to do some fracking in this mountain, for instance, right? There is a high probability here that this fracking is going to fuck up the environment, right? <laughs> so do I, do I get moral impunity because of the conception of possible that Bergson puts in? No, I don't. Yeah. So that's that's where I think that's that's the political limit I'm talking about here. I think we can well, still yeah, and should still. Right, right. So it, it's difficult here to navigate. <laughs> I'm trying to make it. Yeah, I'm trying to make it personal. So that's uh, it's. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for raising that because I'm not saying it in that way. I'm saying it that yeah. the most people who are in positions of power who could actually change something are, mm -hmm. let's say, they're over 50. Mm -hmm. That means that those are the people that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that what the young people are, what they're referring to, although they don't call it, is like they're referring to the future historian. They're saying mm -hmm. to the politicians, how do you think the future historians are going to look at you? Like here in the Netherlands, there were promises to mm -hmm. stop investing in fossil fuels and the politicians are still going to do it. But I mean, maybe 10, 20 years ago, people could have excuses not to... Uh, yeah, maybe we didn't know about it. Now everybody knows about it. It's very, very clear if you make that choice. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm trying to get at is that for a person in that position, it's very difficult to change tech, so to speak, because mm -hmm. that would mean kind of admitting guilt. Mm -hmm. Because it would mean if you say, well, yeah, actually, I do recognize this is a very urgent problem. Mm -hmm. That also means that I somehow have to acknowledge that I'm also 20, 30 years ago could have done something and I didn't do it. Mm. Um, and this might be a big factor. I mean, this is just my kind of association when I read this, right? I don't know if this mm -hmm. is, uh, but this is my, this is my hypothesis that this is also a large factor in why change is not happening now, because mm. if they would change it, it would also be kind of admission of guilt, maybe not even to other people, but more to themselves. Right, right, perhaps. But to, to, to reconnect, though, with, with the idea that, that Bergson tries to put at the center, there is also this quote that I think is very interesting, and I think you pointed out to me as well, but it says, backwards over the course of time, a constant remodeling of the past by the present, of the yeah, cause yeah. by the effect is carried out. And indeed, the effect affects the cause. So the present affects the way we look at the past and the way we interpret that past. And we should perhaps indeed keep that in mind when we, when we tend to simplify explanations as to who is responsible, has to, mm -hmm. I, I see, I see how, how, yes, again, adopting perhaps more of a humble attitude in regards to the absolute unpredictability of events that was at play, even when mistakes, so to say, have been done. So it's, uh, it, it, it's just a balance, I think, that needs to be found between that 
existential slash metaphysical point that Bergson is making and the political and moral implications that could, uh, you know, dangerously be be pulled out of that, I think. So it, it's just finding the balance, I think, is very important here. <laughs> and I don't I'm not quite sure how to how to do it in a, in a you know, in a, in a in a good way. It's, it's actually very difficult. But yeah, it's still it's still a fascinating idea, I think, to just let go of this image of the tree of possible and to let go of this um, of this terrible quote that uh, Gide uh, uh, insisted upon, who said to choose is to renounce. Right. And you mentioned that a bit earlier, like, oh, what how could have my life look like if I uh, would I should I could I, etc. So this is this is interesting on a personal level for for sure. And uh, and it's it's asking myself basically what could happen, say, to go back to my previous example, if I go for a stroll or, or if I don't, misses entirely the point of the unpredictable nature of temporal reality, right? And so we didn't speak too much about this very definition of the duration, but that's that's still that's still exactly what's at play here. And and this is precisely this radical newness that brings about freedom, this unpredictability that has to do with freedom for, for Bergson. So it's not a choice. It's not this idea of, oh, I'm contemplating all these alternative possibilities and I'm just going to choose hop, option B. It's, it's not the, the, the freedom relies or has to do with this newness, with this unpredictability, with this uncharted territory of what the future is. That's very hopeful, right? Because it everything is. is new all the time. And the only thing we can know about the future is that it won't be anything. We can't, we can't predict it. It sounds very optimistic and, and, and positive in the way Bergson writes it, uh, because unpredictability and novelty are, are positively loaded uh, concepts. But, but actually, it's also a bit scary if you think about it, after all. You could also say, well, you know, Damn, we cannot. There is there is a need, a human need that we have to yeah. be able to predict. Foreseeing is so much more comfortable than being constantly on unstable grounds, and and that's what what Bergson asks us to 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 embrace. You know, you on st unstable ground, you don't know what it's gonna be like, and you you need yeah. to just accept that and and see the beauty in embrace that. Embrace yeah, it. In, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm all for it. I think that if one if there's one thing we need now is to the courage to embrace ambiguity and unpredictability, because whether we do that or not, <laughs> I mean it's going to make it easier. What's going because one thing that we do know, even if we look at now at what the uh, you know the climate scientists and the geologists are saying, is they're saying, well, we know there's going to be a lot of in unpredictability and our mm. society has been built on the idea of stability of mm -hmm. that the world is a stage i mean this all relates to what you said before about seeing the world as an objective thing outside of us that is stable and that is ideally not going to change mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but this is only an exception this is only kind of an illusion and actually we are starting to see more and more that that change is actually, that's the reality. And if we embrace that, I think at least it will make it easier for us. Yeah, yeah. And and, and even during the process of, of, uh, of choice, as I was saying earlier, I think it's fascinating to really look at, at, at choice not as something that is static. It is something where we are still continually integrating and make it part of us like it, it becomes part of us it merges with ourselves it changes us while we are thinking if we're going for option b or c or d uh, we, we we are we we might those those product of imaginations they don't exist but they are you know indeed in my mind when i am acting in the world that's you know i don't think bergson would would say that it doesn't exist in that regard like it you know you you project you imagine we constantly do that you know it is we just need to that's the way our our mind is wired we need to do that in order to even survive right but it's just yeah on the one hand this this ability to see that as I am deciding, I am merging, I am morphing, I, you know, and, and then my action might very well just drop naturally, spontaneously from my, my, myself at the moment where the decision needs to be made, right? And also with humility, accepting that it is not, it is not something that 
you know, I, I'm not the kind of like mastermind or orchestrator of which alternatives are going to be chosen that are going to be all the ramifications of these three of possibles that I was talking about earlier, which is a very misleading, though seductive idea, but very misleading idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I've, I guess we have a connection as well to Plato's allegory. He doesn't yeah. he doesn't name it explicitly, I think, but I'll just read this quote that from the perception of change, where he says, mm -hmm. "It is true that for the ancient philosophers, the intelligible world was situated outside and above the one our senses and consciousness perceive. Our faculties of perception showed us only shadows projected in time and space." By immutable and internal ideas. Well, that sounds a lot like the cave. And then he says something about the moderns, and and but then he says, but all of them, Asian, ancient, and moderns, mm -hmm. are agreed in seeing in philosophy a substitution of the concept for the percept. Mm -hmm. They all appeal from the insufficiency of our senses and consciousness to the functions of abstraction, generalization, and reasoning. So. Mm -mm. So in my own words, saying that the, the ancients say, well, our senses are imperfect, change is an illusion, and the abstract, that is more real. Yeah, that's, it's, uh, it's an interesting. It's funny, I almost have the impression to read Nietzsche when, when, uh, when, uh, when you quote this. And it's true that at yeah. first glance, I, I couldn't think of anything more remote from Bergson than the theory of forms, you know, when it, at first, you know, when you think, okay, Plato, allegory of the cave and Bergson, how does that relate? Well, you know, on the one hand, Bergson labels his philosophy a true empiricism. So aiming to enter the objects themselves in their yeah. singularity and duration, right? Plato, on the other end, is, you know, is an idealist and sees the forms as the ultimate reality. He looks for the immutable, the timeless, the unchangeable ideas, which are defined by abstracted common features of the singular temporal objects that Bergson is focusing on. So, he, you know, by contrast, of course, Plato looks at the intemporal, the perfect model examples of things as, you know, they are in the, in the world of forms, right? And so there is, you know, on the one hand, an attention to concrete singularity and temporal temporality. And on the other, you know, on the other end, Plato's side, there is this generalized abstraction. And so for, for Bergson, really, you can, you can imagine how Plato is really fleeing away from life and the world that our bodies inhabit. And that's precisely what Bergson is trying to, for us to do, is to really inhabit this world and not fleeing away from life. But um, even if Bergson would never say that knowledge is, you know, this upward movement, this dialectical upward movement, saving us from the illusion of the world of appearances, da, 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 he certainly wouldn't say that, you know, true reality consists of immutable and changing forms, that's for sure. Because for Bergson, the real is, again, pure duration. It's this heterogeneous qualitative multiplicity. But I would say that both Bergson and Plato advocate for a form of intuition, though. I don't know what you think about that, but there, there is not in what, you know, definitely they have a different definition of what the real is. Definitely they're not agreeing on that. But the way the way they want to access that reality, that authentic reality, can can be paralleled. What do you think? Well, I compl I'm very happy you say that. I completely <laughs> agree. And this also connects to the, the project of this podcast because Bergson is contrasting his philosophy with that of the ancients. Mm -hmm. But I myself make a distinction between Plato and the Platonists. So I mm -hmm. think in many ways, the Platonists did what Whitehead before was criticizing as well, like making this system mm -hmm. about it, going outside yeah. and everything. I think that what Plato is showing, and I had, uh, I don't remember the episode number, but Mark Reinhardt, we did an episode about looking at the Republic, the form of the text, and how the Republic, the text of which the, the allegory of the cave is part, makes explicit that Socrates in this text is trying to say something rather than saying it, like we Bergson said before mm, about philosophers. Yeah, yeah. So a number of times Socrates says that, well, actually the philosophy, so they're talking about the ideal philosophy, but 
He's also saying, well, actually, I cannot tell you this ideal philosophy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think both authors speak about the harshness of the of not only of, you know, the dialectic process, and we get back to that, but also about yeah. communicating, about expressing with language what this real is, right? Yeah. Be it the good for Plato and the duration for, for Bergson. There is the same concern for the fact that some things are not easy to just verbalize at all. And so it's uh, it's uh, it, it is interesting to see some kind of, of parallel here, nonetheless, because I think both Bergson and Plato are advocating for this intellectual sympathy that transcends the normal scientific kind of framework or method, right? So they're both asking us to go beyond the mere analysis. If yeah. you look at the prisoner that's released from the cave. He has to gradually strengthen his vision to adapt it to brightness and ultimately yeah, exactly. to the sun. Similarly, Bergson doesn't tell us that intuition is immediate in the sense that it's easily accessible. It's immediate, but not, not in that sense. It, you cannot adopt intuition just naively and, and easily. It's a long apprenticeship, really, that is necessary in order to, to get there. So the journey to knowledge in that regard, to intuition for, uh, for Bergson, is a process. And actually an unexpectedly painful one, too, that goes against our mental habits, our usual way of perceiving, of thinking, our language, of perception, our intellect, right? We have to proceed to this intellectual conversion. And you really have this theme of the conversion also in the allegory of the cave. So perhaps we could find that similarity of method in both Plato and Bergson in order to reach the real. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, it is uh, I think that's where I see uh, something comparable. To gain knowledge of what is real, we must go beyond the, you know, scientific method and symbolism. We, we must go beyond even language and discover an intuition through which we can directly enter into the real as yeah. we enter into the, you know, the vision of the sun, for instance. Yeah, and then it's a question, is the allegory of the cave has been criticized, but again, the interpreters of, of Plato have been criticized for saying we have to go above perception. We have to get out of this world, the world of our that we normally perceive. That's, uh, I mean, I'm also speaking about Christianity later. Well, this is just like the bad world and there's a higher world out there mm -hmm. somewhere, not where we are. But is that really what what the allegory of cave is saying or is it right. because this this quote by Bergson but suppose that instead of trying to rise above our perception of things right, right. we were to plunge into it for the purpose of deepening and widening it and yeah. you're right yeah to point out that Beto is speaking about pain which is a very physical experience mm -hmm. he's speaking about vision mm -hmm. uh, he's speaking about uh, don't just the prisoner it's not enough to just turn their head they have to in turn the whole body Right. But that's almost like saying, I mean, they didn't have the word intuition. But if you say that, well, mm -hmm. you have to use your whole body, isn't that saying you have to use, including your smell and your hearing and, and right. everything like that? It is very embodied indeed. Yes. Yeah. Mm -mm. So how do, we, um, how do we do that? How do we plunge into our perception and philosophize? <laughs> That is that is precisely, you know, to go back to to what I was saying earlier, it is so very hard to give a positive and I think it would al almost be, uh, you know, uh, treacherous <laughs> in regards to what what Bergson says about about language precisely. Like it, it is very hard to to positively describe with words what that plunge really, really looks like. And it's perhaps Bergson has to stay on the threshold of this invitation to by speaking, you know, kind of like identifying all these blinders that we have in order to, you know, encourage us to let go of them. But then what's going to appear will, will, of course, remain extremely not only personal, but extremely different uh, depending on the on the, you know, on the period of time you do it precisely because it needs to be taken into account the time in which it is being done. And so that, that I think is just, again, for instance, let's, let's look at, for instance, I'm looking at, uh, I don't know, this, uh, I'm looking at this cushion right now. And it's, you know, it, it's, I'm appreciating its texture, etc. 
I could I could do that for a while, but just talking about it with you, first of all, deprives it already from from that intuitive approach I'm supposed to adopt, mm-hmm. right? But let's say I'm doing this. Well, let's say I'm doing it again in two hours. I might encounter an entirely different experience. So this is also what it, it, where we need to be careful is that entering into reality itself, it's not as if we were able to render duration static, right? And say, okay, now I've seen the pillow for what it is, you know, <laughs> and what it will always be. No, it will change. And so that, again, you know, takes us back to what we said about the experience between this link between me, my feelings, my, yeah, my, 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 my inner approach to the world and the world, right? So it's not going to give us more of an objective kind of uh, 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 certitude about the world. I like this image of because everything is moving all the time. Right. But this image of two trains that move at the same speed. Mm-hmm. So you and the, the cushion at that moment are moving at the same speed. So <laughs> it might give you the impression that it's like the uh, and like immutable and, and eternal. Right. But it's just like, yeah, travelers that encounter each other. And sometimes you travel together a little bit and that allows you to speak together. That allows you to exchange something maybe. Right. And then so many other things could happen to that train on, you know, one train or the other <laughs> that would, you know, reshape the way we can have this discussion between me and the pillow. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so good to talk with you about all this. It's, uh, it was interesting for me to actually go through the gymnastics of finding, you know, echoes between Plato and Bergson, which is so mm. counterintuitive to me at first. But when you actually look closely at the text, it's it's not it's not that uh, it's not that opposed at all. No. Mm-hmm. No, maybe they were seeing the same whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we could speak about this for for a long time. But yes, I'm but we, happy with know. this kind of. <laughs> I'm also happy with this kind of talk where we have kind of you know maybe an idea of what Bergson has to offer, which may also motivate people to read him, because that's just, I mean, we can talk about it all we want, but that's just a really different experience, I think. Yeah, it's funny. It's actually, uh, it, really, it actually made me willing to incorporate him in the class I'm going to be teaching next quarter, huh? which is epistemology. And I was like, you know what? I mean, epistemology could be so many things. Like, you could have a boring class about, you know, Descartes, Locke, you know, Berkeley, Hume, Kant. <laughs> and you're like, but... Precisely, go beyond the Kant and, you know, I wanted to bring some niche in there, but also I thought Bergson has actually a very interesting thing to say that I would have a hard time calling it epistemological because it has this mechanistic, analytical tone to it that Bergson wants to precisely avoid, but it is nonetheless an attempt to describe another type of knowledge, an intuitive form of knowledge that I think would be actually very interesting to explore uh, for the students. So... So thank you for initiating that uh, <laughs> that kind of new trajectory of my class. <laughs> thank you so much. I hope there won't be too many storms there in California anymore. Me neither. Let's hope the mudslides are over indeed. <laughs> and uh, next time we'll speak about your work on feminism, which we, I wanted to discuss now, but it wouldn't do it justice. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. Yeah, me too. Let's, uh, let's do that soon. And, uh, and in the meantime, I wish you a great day. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Mario. Thank you for listening. You can find more information about Sean on our website. And go to livefromplatoscave.com for more episodes. And I published an article on Future Based. It's about the climate crisis. And I end with a quote of Bergson that we also read in this episode. Next episode, I will interview Lee McIntyre about his book, How to Talk to a Science Denier. 